Welcome to the Peak Performance Greatness Show. I'm Christopher Dedan, founder and CEO of Devian Enterprises, Inc. We are committed to optimize people's performance with tools such as peak performance speaking, coaching, and consulting programs for a worldwide international community. We believe that the only difference between where you are and where you want to be is acquiring the knowledge you need and consistently utilizing that knowledge to become a peak performing individual in every area of your life. Stick around until the end of the show where we will reveal how you can become the next guest on the fastest growing inspirational educational podcast on the planet in 20 to 30 minutes. Let's go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peak Performance Greatness Show. I'm your host, Christopher Didian, and today I have Richard Blank. He is the CEO of Costa Rica's Call Center. Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Poor Vita, Christopher. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. I love the Peak Performance Show. This is going to be amazing today. Richard, I know it's going to be amazing just with the small conversation that we had before, just how we were jiving and our energy was flowing. But before going into all that fun stuff that I want to talk about from the ideology of how you've grown your business, uh, how you created your team culture, the pinball machines and all that fun stuff. Give me a little bit more introduction of who you are. I gave a small one. So unpack that a bit more. Tell us who you are, what you do for our viewers and our listeners. I'll give you the cliff note version. I'll make it real quick. I'm a very proud Philadelphia boy. So I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia. And when I graduated Abington High School, I decided to double down on my favorite class, which was Spanish and recess. So I decided to do both. I was a Spanish communication major at the University of Arizona for public speaking rhetoric and nonverbal communication. I interned at Telemundo during school, post-grad work for the importers of Corona. So I was involved with Spanish sales and marketing. And at 27 years old, because I've been here for 22 years, I I had an opportunity, a one in a million shot that crossed my path. And a very good friend of mine owned a call center here and asked, he said, Richie, why don't you come down for a couple months and teach some English? And I decided to, on a whim, just come on down. And two years turned into four or two months turned into four years working with my friend. So in essence, it was really my graduate school. I learned the call center business from the inside and out. And... I also learned that you can enhance the experience for the agent and for the client. And so when I was in my mid thirties, I felt I was mature enough and had my impulse control where I could be responsible for contracts, for job stability, and to throw my hat in the ring and start a company. And I'll be definitely discussing some of my company culture with you later in the show. Okay. So that is definitely a fun arc. First and foremost, I just have to ask, are you a sportsman by any chance? Cause you said Philly and I know Philly, like, the people that are very proud of Philly are like sports fans and whatnot. I just want to validate before I say anything in that regards. I have a Bernie Perrant shrine on my wall. I have a framed Randall Cunningham jersey. And so I, I have a lot of Philadelphia pride. Uh, <laughs> when we lose, I'm very upset. When we win, I'll let everybody know. And when people order cheesesteaks that they don't put whiz on it, I have to say something. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> I love it because you're definitely coming out of that as that Philly boy. And I will not mention what happened to the 76ers. Uh, so we won't, we, we won't talk about that, especially like, Please you know, I'll, I'm from Montreal and I'm, I'm a Raptors fan. So we're a couple of years back within that situation. But anyways, all that being said, let's not digress here. Let's talk about what happened. Like you said, when you went to Costa Rica, thinking that it was only a couple of months and then end up just building a career there and becoming in this call center, did you see yourself building a call center? Did you, is that something that you had like an ambition towards any side of the business or was it just the culture, the, the Latin Spanish culture that attracted you, especially that you were somebody that had studied uh, Spanish at such a high level in Philadelphia? What's interesting, because no one ever grows up to be a CEO of a call center. In fact, most of us don't know what it is, except for what we see on TV, or when we're calling very frustrated for your cable or phone service. But there's a lot of people out there that earn a living with customer support, telemarketing, and work at these areas. And I'd like to also maybe shed some light in regards to what an owner of a call center is, because I'm not really what you see on TV. I'm not a boiler room closer. I could be. But to answer your question, this is a very strict Catholic country. And besides being able to fulfill the needs of my clients, I have to fulfill the needs of the agent. And I wanna make sure they can go home and tell their parents what they do for a living. But when I was here and I first saw what a call center looked like, there were hundreds and hundreds of bilingual agents that were on the phone conversing with clients and converting calls and, and getting positive escalations. They were doing well. 
And for me, I saw this environment, A, that was easy for me. I wanted to learn it. And it was young. These kids are in their mid-20s, post-grad, having a great time. So it really gave me a chance to fulfill one of my vision quests, a spiritual journey, because I didn't know where I was going. Most of my friends were going to Ivy League to study medicine, law, engineering, and architecture. And, and they heard my thoughts and my dreams. And sometimes as a dreamer, Christopher, you feel alone. Mm -hmm. And as much as they couldn't compare notes with me, they were very supportive of my ambition and where I was going. And how about this? If you can get past your parents' guilt, you can pretty much live anywhere in the world. So I decided once again to maybe be a little selfish. My intentions were honorable, but I wanted to see what I could do and where my potential was. And after my friend extended me this incredible opportunity to learn customer support, sales retention, human resources, onboarding, marketing, search engine optimization, it was almost like I had to do this because I was getting towards my 30s and I realized that life goes by quickly. So you're probably expecting this teenage whiz kid or this genius in their 20s that cracked a code. But since you're my friend, I'll be very forthright with you. It took me into my mid 30s to be mature enough and ready enough to start a company. It's a huge responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. I might've had the ambition and the vigor to do it earlier, but I might've not had the structure and discipline and the cognitive skills to be able to handle such sort of movement and the human resources aspect to it. But um, the best way, in my opinion, as a CEO to run a company is to give the people that work with you their dignity. The number one thing I saw, Christopher, working at this call center was that people felt like they were robots they felt like they were numbers and they felt like they were expendable. And so check this out. We were talking earlier, you admire the jukebox and the candy machines, but there's, I got tons of pinball machines and an air hockey table. There's so many treasures here I find in Costa Rica and I'm from the eighties, so I love arcades, but imagine your first day with me and you're supposed to show up at Monday morning at 7 a.m. for a training class and everyone's half awake. My class starts at 7.30 because from seven to 7.30, you're doing recess. You are in my game room, you're playing games, you're meeting the new people that you're gonna be working with, you're meeting me. And so imagine how you start your class that way. Everyone's having a great time, we're friends and they're very relaxed. So instead of absorbing, now they're contributing. And it just really adds to the momentum of the first day. And a lot of the agents, Christopher, will say that I'm the first boss that ever knew their name. First, that's a shame, but unfortunately, that's the reality. And I may be the last boss to ever know their name, but if they're with me and they're walking with me, I will 100% make sure that they are known. And my goal is to promote them from within. Okay. So Richard, I mean, that was great. There were so many things you mentioned that I do. I, I want to unpack and I want to go in depth a bit more with some of the, the concepts. So first and foremost, I love the fact, thank you for your honesty and clarity on the aspect of you were cognitive enough to notice that, hey, it took me up to my mid thirties to be mature enough to have the cognitive skills to run a business. And that's super, super cool because nowadays there's a lot of young entrepreneurs and CEOs because it's just really uptick, almost like something like it became popularized, especially with the uh, social media, especially with the accessibility of being a entrepreneur. Back in the day, we didn't have the same accessibility. Now with having an app, being an influencer and all that is great, but it definitely, there is a difference between being in your mid thirties towards being in your early twenties or younger. And I'm 33. I run my own business. I'm, I'm a CEO as well. And the fact that you said that I'm like, oh my God. So that just means I have even greater years to come because there's still some maturity. There's still some experience that I'm going to gain. So that's one thing I wanted to highlight for well, all. Slow down our for a second. Obviously, you're better looking and smarter than me, so you have more potential. But this is the one thing I want you to pay very, very close attention to, my good friend. It's, it's dedicated practice. No, you make it look easy, but your audience and your friends don't see the sort of work that you do off camera yeah. and the communication that we had prior to this podcast. You, you take your work seriously mm -hmm. and you're investing your time in this. And if people think that being a CEO is just the bells and the whistles and the glamour, that, that's rubbish. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of hard work that is put into this. If you want a title, give yourself a title. If you want a parking spot, who cares? 
the most important thing is that sort of mutual respect that you have. Mind you this, Christopher, you're a CEO of a company and you're going to grow a huge company. I have 150 agents. They're not afraid of me. They should be. I'm from North America. I'm a boss of a company. They should be terrified of me. And that's not fair because it seems like I have multiple strikes against me. So that's why initially I do my best to ensure that everybody is meeting me in the middle and that I am a man with feelings and emotions and I'm still a strong man and I stand behind what I do. But fear is a morbid anticipation of something that hasn't even happened yet. So why would you be afraid of me if you're showing up on time front row center and you're a great kid? I'm the person that's supposed to be wind in your sales. So I believe that people go through these stages and these, these coming of age moments at different times. So yeah. don't judge me, my friend, on, on my stage. I moved abroad. I'm in a call center industry. It's, it's Locura. You are on your own path. And the fact that you're a CEO at 33 means that you're already way ahead of where I was. So I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing your momentum and your bright career. First of all, brother, I really appreciate that. And let me just swing it back to, because everything you just said, you just dropped so many gems, like so many drop, my, uh, drop mic moments over there. And I wanted to correlate it to one thing. And this is me being 100% honest with you. I'm not blowing steam up here, but you are okay. a very eloquent speaker. Okay. And like I said, I'm a professional speaker and a peak performance coach. And like you said, I take my craft extremely seriously. Not only seriously, I truly am a passionate about communication. And the second, that you, the second that you, you started this podcast, it's so evident that you are as well, which makes sense because you run a, a communication center, you run a call center. So I want to talk about a bit more what you have learned over the years when it comes to the art of communication for entrepreneurs, the art of the nonverbal, the art of, because you do it very methodically, the, the aspect of getting your employees and colleagues to come in 30 minutes earlier before doing a workshop with them, getting them to play and getting them in that ideology of having fun, increasing their serotonin levels before giving them the lesson is positioning them in a way to receive the information in a such more eloquent and receptive way. So let's talk about that because you're definitely a master in that craft. So what can you tell us about that aspect of communication and nonverbal that you have been using throughout your career? And I'm having like the best time of my life right now. It's like a candy store. You're talking about my favorite topic. Why don't we begin with conflict management? Let's just begin there. Okay. And initially when I'm onboarding a new agent that's never even worked at a call center before, the first thing I'll let them know that learning a second language is 10 times harder than what they're about to do. So I can put things in perspective. The second thing is their vocabulary. I would like for them to invest in a thesaurus. So besides learning the definition, they learn similes. For an example, instead of saying help on a phone call, Christopher, I'd prefer to use words like assist guide and lend a hand. It's more diplomatic, it's more strategic. You can reduce any sort of ego defense and any sort of rabbit holes. But let's go over a second what a potential phone call could look like if you're prospecting to a company. May I give you a story and an example please, of what please it would do. look like? Please do, go for Excellent, it. thank you. I, I believe that every conversation has an introduction, a body and a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer in an attention span of 30 seconds to two minutes. My forte is micro expression reading. I love body language, but if you do not have the luxury of sight, you're eliminating on the phone three of your senses your taste, touch, and smell. Your hearing should be expanded. The scientists say this if you lose one of your senses. But then people complain that you can't see people. We're not talking about the Zoom call. We're talking about a normal phone call. I believe in image streaming. And I also know that books are better than movies when you use your imagination. So I'm just expecting you to expand your vocabulary and your descriptions. But let's get back into what an average phone call looks like. You're calling into a company. So I'm calling the peak performance greatness show, right? And not you, but your associate answers the phone. And so what I would be doing is taking advantage of anonymity for the first time that I speak. A lot of people will hedge and use um, a very easy way just to say, hey, how are you doing today? And you could get mixed results. I'd rather say, hey, how's peak performance doing today? And so of course the person answering the phone is doing great. I said it better than they did. And they're in a good mood because that's the first impression I give. And then it's usually when they ask me their first question, who are you? And there's a technique that I use. 
It's called the buffer boomerang technique. What happens is somebody might answer you or question you with a negative tone. Question's fine, it's just the tone. So someone says, what is your name? I would say, Kathy, that's an excellent question. My name is Richard Blank. So what I do is I buffer it by name dropping you. I let you know that it's an excellent question or I'm glad that you brought it up. I repeat the question that you say so I can show active listening and I will boomerang it right back at you or the Richard plus two, just so I can readjust the tone of a call. This happens constantly. When people are asking you buffer boomerangs, just make sure that you return it and you move it forward. So anyway, I answer Kathy's question. She likes how I answered it. She thinks I'm a great guy. And she's about to transfer me to Christopher. But before we transfer, I let Kathy know, hey, I just wanna let you know, when I speak with Christopher, how amazing you are. We call that positive escalation in our industry. So of course she's gonna to wanna to transfer the call. So now I get transferred to Christopher and I got a momentum going and Kathy loves me the whole shebang. Before I even introduce myself, I use the anonymity again. I say, hey, Christopher, by the way, Kathy's the most amazing employee that you have. So I'm giving a gift. And then once again, you'll ask me the boomerang question. What is your name or who are you? What company do you have? And we start that conversation and I think it's great. So then we're in the body of the call and I'm representing all of the three or four things that I can offer you. What a lot of people do is they, they do desert pitching, which means they just run and there's no oasis. There's no chance for a positive or negative reinforcement or even to gauge, because I know what I know. I'd love to know what you know so I could readjust myself. And so when I usually give a list, I like to do things like a dessert tray where each one gets its presentation like the price is right, like Kathleen Bradley, and we can smile and we can present this. And I can gauge if you like it or not. And I'm also not brazen enough to think you like everything, but I would definitely say, hey, Christopher, I'm sure you like at least one. And so what we do is we take a horizontal to a vertical, and then I start stacking your answers with open-ended questions for explanations. And so at least I can anchor in something that you like. So now we're still in the body of the call and we're not sure what to do because we're, this is a person we're meeting for the first time. There is a technique which I call is the micro expression reading, okay? People do micro expression reading where they study people's body language, but this is phonetic. And I believe it's the purest form of speech. And so when someone is speaking with you, there's four parts of phonetics. You have tone rate, pitch, and duration. Your tone, yours especially, Christopher, is confident and empathetic. I believe that that should be a consistent variable. But you're also familiar with the mirror imaging technique. You've heard it before. It's a strategy on the phone. My suggestion is to mirror image their rate and their pitch. Why? Because if you do a spike or a dip in regards to your phonetics, that would then tell me to ask you either a tie down, pin down or clarification question. Sounds good, right? Makes sense or for my edification and clarification, was it ABC or one, two, three? And so those could still be manipulated, Christopher. Someone can manipulate a tone rate and a pitch, but the real tell sign, the real tell sign is the answering speed. That is something that is, um, once again, subconscious. And so as much as you can control and manipulate the other factors of phonetics, your answering speed is purely subconscious. And so my opinion is if it's not consistent, that would definitely be a marker for you to do a clarification and to pause before moving forward because people wonder why at the end of a 10 minute call, you don't have a, an appointment. It's because you left the door open. So let's say we're buffer boomeranging I'm positive escalating, um, phonetic micro expression reading so I can do the tie downs. It's working great. Now we're in the conclusion of the call, okay? And what I like to do is to rake it one more time. I would say, Christopher, since you have me on the phone, do you have any final questions? Remember, you liked A. What about B, C, or D? Oh, you like C. C for Christopher, of course. And then we start talking about that again. So at least I raked it one more time, but, but we're still not finished. When I'm confirming your information, I love to use the military alphabet. It's clean, it's concise. And don't kid yourself, we're supposed to be ending a phone call, but who's to say that once I start doing military alphabet, you're gonna tell me you served, know someone that served, or you love the military. So the next thing you know, I'm talking about my father, post-Korea counterintelligence that served to my uncle in World War II. And, we bonded there, but I'm still not done. 
Because right when we're ending that call and I'm showing that I'm active listening, reviewing everything and you love it, when I send you the letter, the follow-up letter, I'm going to give the written positive escalation about your associate. And that's the Richard circle because when I call you back and Kathy answers the phone, she's excited to hear from me, but she's also going to say, Richard, out of the 10 years I've been working at this company, you're the first person to ever write that. And so that's the relationship, my good friend, that you and I and your associates will have before any contracts or before anything. It will not compromise ethics, values, and morals, but it will give you that sort of consistency. But there's one last thing I'd like to share in regards to my techniques. We're, we're doing these Zoom calls and people have dogs in the background, children are noise. My suggestion is to use the Me Too technique. Everybody loves dogs, but inadvertently and passive aggressively, I could let you know, hey, I, I love your dog because it's barking and it's killing the call. But the active listener will then say, Christopher, what's your dog's name? And you're gonna say Fluffy. Fluffy sounds great. So then all of a sudden you put Fluffy outside, you come back and we're really anchoring at that section, not my pitching and not positive escalation and closing you. It's about your dog. And that's usually the time, Christopher, when a potential client will say, uh, excuse me, what is your name again? And then I'll say, Christopher, I'm so glad that you asked. Once again, my name is Richard Blank. And then you're name dropping me the rest of the call. And so instead of grading you on what we usually do by asking information and converting a call, I, I give the most points for soft skills. And if somebody says your name in the body of the call, not the intro and the conclusion, but that body, I give you the most points. You've done it. That's exactly your goal. And those are the sort of ethics that I train the agents so they can have their composure on the phone. They, they're not a print. They become a painting. They're not a character, Christopher. They become in character. And if they can remain raw, like you and I do, so we're professionals and we're established, but we're still raw. And we still have this sort of essence that got us to where we are today and what made us begin in the first place. Richard, once again, you just gave a masterclass on sales. Legit, <laughs> you, you gave a straight up masterclass on sales. And I'm going to do my best right now to highlight certain things. I really want the listeners and the viewers to really get some of the things that you really highlighted. So first and foremost, when it yes, comes brother, to- Go for it. Yeah, and you're going to correct me. You're going to kind of fill in the gaps over here. But I definitely spotted many things because I don't know if you know my background is actually real estate. And that's how I started my entrepreneurial journey as a broker. And I used to do thousands of calls per month to get my properties listed, sold. I used to do door knocking and all that stuff. So I really perfected, not as much as you, but I developed, let's call it, not even perfected. I developed the skill of communication or sales via phone. Now, one thing I wanted to highlight right off the bat. The, a lot of the things that you were saying were linked up with NLP, so neuro linguistic processing. When you mentioned, you don't say, how are you doing today? Because it gives an opportunity for the person to think, oh, wait a minute, I'm not feeling good and change their framework. You use something like, how is the peak performance greatness show doing today? Which is a neutral position and it's only positive. So that's the first thing. You have to be very careful with the wordage that you're using. Another thing that you mentioned, you mentioned it several times, anchoring. So you're anchoring positive experiences with the person in regards to maybe things that they like, uh, the idea of the uh, alphabet. So of the uh, phonetic alphabet, one is linked up with army. And then people like, hey, if somebody has any link with army, that creates a positive ripple of joy. Usually people that think of that, the mirroring aspect, very important over here. Uh, as a speaker, my listeners and my viewers know, I speak extremely fast, but I'm able mm -hmm. to understand that not everybody speaks at that same level. So you always have to mirror and meet the people where they are at and then slowly, once you're in groove with them, bringing them up to the level that you want. So as you were mentoring the mirroring aspect to listen to, hey, are they talking a bit slower? Are they talking faster? You want to be in sync with them. So then you could kind of guide them throughout the conversation. Furthermore, you, last thing that you, actually a couple of last things over here that, I, that you mentioned, the name aspect, highly important. You mentioned to the previous point as well, getting the people to know your name and you know their name, especially if they got your name in the middle, knows that you shows that you are in real great rapport with these individuals. And one last thing over here, I wanted to highlight, and maybe our viewers saw it maybe a bit easier or our listeners spotted it. The second, Richard, that you were doing the role play and you started asking questions, your face went from neutral to extreme smile. 
and you were correlating it to a phone conversation not being face to face. So the question is, why does Richard smile when he's talking to somebody if nobody sees him? Because subconsciously, when he smiles, the great endorphins, the great serotonin within his body goes up. And not only that, his intonation changes. So even though somebody's not seeing it, they're instantly feeling it. So be very much aware of your, 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 your nonverbal when you're on the phone. And I've actually never done a sales call sitting down. So that's one thing as well that I kind of want to uh, invite in that regard. Yeah. Richard, did I do an okay job kind of highlighting certain of the points that you mentioned that I really want people to catch on? You are my teacher's pet and I'm not giving you homework for tonight. You did phenomenal. There we and, go. And, I, and we're very much on the, and I can't wait to when we speak off the podcast as well. We have so many things to share. And you know, it's another interesting technique. It's the pronoun because I can't name drop you a thousand times, Christopher, then it will lose its luster. And so I believe that by bringing people in by saying you are, are, it could still catch their attention. And usually the name drop goes for the tie down question, the anchoring or the transitional sentences. But every sentence usually has a pronoun. It's the cousin of the name drop. So I believe it should be done on about a five to one basis just to keep their attention. But I love that. This is incredible. I mean, you and I are going back and forth amazing yeah. on this. Yeah, we're, we're having we're, the best time. We're definitely geeking out because like you said, like when it comes to communication, <laughs> I'm a geek and it shows that you know your stuff too. So we're definitely playing a, a fun game of tennis in that regard. If we switch it yeah. up to the fact that sure. you are obviously very successful, like we're seeing, and you have thousands of employees or you train thousands of employees and so on and so forth. And you did talk about some of the techniques that you have in regards to building culture with the games, with the candy, uh, uh, um, the pinball machines and all that fun stuff. What are some of the sure. tricks, methodologies that you utilize, or you could tell a young entrepreneur when it comes to building culture, not only face-to-face, -face, but now in the new age of this hybrid business model, which you're not necessarily face-to-face -face with your team, which creates another uh, difficulty level, if I may say in that regard. So what is some of your experience in that regard? And what do you do to really have the great team culture and business culture that you have? It's a wonderful question, but there are certain parts to it. I think the first thing we should do is to make sure that whoever works with you has all of their resources. And so I have to make sure that they have their script, their rebuttals, they learn the CRM, they learn the phone system, because that reduces any sort of uncertainty and stress. That's number one. Since COVID, um, we've had to send at least 50% of our agents to work from home. Mm -hmm. And that's been a challenge for us because a lot of call centers, because it's brick and mortar, we have our internet redundancy. I have a backup generator for electricity and I have immediate IT support with an IT department. And when people are working from home, they don't have those things. But I'm so centrally located that God forbid one of those three things happen. They can be in my call center on a turnkey station within a half an hour. I miss walking the rows and having them packed. I have about 30% of my agents here, the rest are at home, but it, that was my essence. I used to love to walk the rows and stop and listen to people. And, and as you mentioned, the games and eating with them, but let's also see the benefits of them working from home. First and foremost, they're saying, spending more time with family, mm -hmm. saving a ton of money, uh, their production has been fine. I was expecting some shenanigans. It's more disruptions. They're still taking it seriously, but they're missing the camaraderie. As much as we can open up as many channels as we want to communicate yes. and to yes. have that bonding. But the one advantage that I have is I get to see a little bit more about them besides what they wrote on their resume and talking to them in the office. I, I can see what's in their home and I can tease them about a stuffed bunny in the corner or compliment some sort of artwork in the background and um, just like this, you would have never known about me yeah. unless you get to see me. And so it's a give or a take. Maybe I'm being a little selfish because I miss them terribly. And that was some of my culture. But then again, things are changing. And as long as I can give them that sort of support, and as long as I can listen to their calls and not just say, good job, champ. No, what did champ do? I'm going to call Christopher. I'm going to let him know on minute three, you did a perfect rebuttal and that your boss really listened to you. Yeah. Uh, that's the sort of stuff that I get back. And I guess finally, really what it has to do with building a culture is once again, not compromising their ethics. I compete against Amazon, HP, Intel, and Oracle. Jeff Bezos has 10,000 agents here. And I usually will lose somebody, Christopher, on a natural attrition. They'll leave me because their boyfriend or girlfriend works there, scheduling because of school, closer to home. 
but there's nobody that's going to walk out of my office and say, Christopher yelled at me, Richard insulted me. I don't feel comfortable here. So I can hold my head up high there, but this is very competitive. But as I said before, the best thing I can do is prepare people, put them on a level playing field, give them their dignity, and once again, try to improve their self-reliance and self-confidence. Check this out. Since Amazon is here and we're a very big uh, BPO because of our scalability, our proximics to the United States, um, we have a only democratic society, no standing army, 95% literacy rate, our labor pool rocks. But in order for us to scale and expand, I might need to bring in some freshmen, right? So I almost prefer that. If they come into my call center bilingual, even with a slight accent, it still bears the mark of higher education. They've shown structure and discipline, like I have by speaking Spanish and showing my good faith. I'd rather mold them. I'd rather give them Christopher and Richard techniques compared to having some hot shot QB1 coming in with bad habits and could potentially be a cancer in the center. They're just not worth it. It's not very difficult to onboard somebody. I just got to teach them the system and how to use a phone. But if they have a personality, if they have courage, and if they are willing to invest their time with me, absolutely. I will do whatever I can to delegate more responsibility and find ways to promote you at this company. Mm -hmm. I love that. Wow, that was a very concise and like a response to that. I really, really do love it, Richard. And you got me in a groove, man. You I mean, me I mean, we're we're flowing. I'm looking the time by spine. There's still a couple of questions I want to ask, but before doing so, we kind of talked about, you know, obviously you have a calling center and so on and so forth. You talked about that there's Amazon's oracles in the same area of Costa Rica, because like you said, the numbers you just dropped about Costa Rica, I didn't even know. That's very, very interesting to see that how developed oh, yeah. it is. I've heard great things of there, but I've never been. That being said, uh -huh. what do you guys sell in your call center? If we could go into that a bit. Okay. Um well, we're very selective of the campaigns that come in. In fact, I turn down most. There are five campaigns I don't do. I have nothing against it, just won't do it. I, I don't do sports books, casinos, stocks, pharmacies, or sweepstakes. Okay. I work with uh, small to medium-sized companies in the United States, Canada, and Europe, certain verticals, for an example, in inbound movies and music support. I work with law firms. I work with industrial real estate companies and transportation companies and travel companies. Half of my call center does outbound lead generation and appointment setting. The other half does omni-channel non-voice support, back office support or customer support. And so, as I say before, in my 14 years, being selective has given me the stability because of my reputation. I, I am a guest in this country and it's imperative for me to be able to once again offer the Costa Ricans not only a stable job, but a job where they can feel fulfilled. And um, a lot of the times the clients will have unrealistic expectations and even worse, Christopher, they will not respect the Costa Rican labor laws. So a lot of the times I have to explain to them what I'm able and not able to do. Mm -hmm. And also ethically, what I feel comfortable doing. And, I just want my grandparents to be proud of me. I just want to make sure that whatever I have done, I could look at myself in the mirror at the end of the day and realize I can earn a dollar a thousand ways. Why can't I do it the way that I was raised? Why can't I just do it the old school way where I can sleep at night, I can be proud of myself. And really the market speaks. If, if I were a terrible boss and doing all the wrong things, no one would be here. It's like that kid's birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese where no one shows up. You have no friends. And if I were a terrible boss and no one came back, that would let me know I was doing all the wrong things. And so I just want to be a positive representative of the United States here. I'm very proud of the United States, but I'm an expat. I decided to move abroad. Doesn't mean I don't love the States, but I had other areas that were calling me. And I kind of believe in the stars. I kind of believe that things were destined for me without sounding spiritual, but no, how else do you explain it? That, how else do you put it into perspective what just happened? And so when you see me here, I live it every day, relentlessly yes. positive. I'm so happy because this was a long shot that shouldn't have happened, but this run has been for 22 years. And so of course I'm, 
tapping my toes and realizing that I have that attitude where whatever happens, I'm in a great mood that day. Uh, man, I love your energy. You have it so spot on. It's so obvious that you're living your true purpose. You talked about, you know, kind of like the, let's call it the universe getting you in this place. I truly believe every single person has a gift. And once they are living within their gift, within this beautiful world, this universe, you just cannot be anything other than happy. I would say 95% of the time. And another thing that you mentioned, which I'm a true fan of, and I've mentioned it on this podcast several times, I'm a, I'm a capitalist, right? Like I'm all about you know, being an entrepreneur, making money, but I'm a capitalist with empathy. If you're making money, you do not hurt the earth. You do not hurt others. You do not do anything negative by all means, go for it, which is what you were mentioning with the regards to certain people or certain services that you like to uh, promote and sell within your brand towards others. Because the end goal is like you said, you want your, to make your grandparents proud. And I mean, that's if, if there isn't like a better thing to think about than that, I don't know what is. Listen, Richard, like hey, I said, we're going on a little rant. This? Sorry, go for I it. I feed 150 families a month. There, that's, that's my goal. That, that's where it comes first. And it makes me humble that I do like this. 100%. Oh, we're so much on the same yeah. page. It's crazy. All right, Richard, I'm going to ask you two last questions because I see the time trickling on. And this was like just amazing. My... My question right now is, it's very obvious, once again, that you are highly successful, very obvious that you know your stuff and you're extremely passionate about it. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from your success, which we already have within this podcast. Please guys, re-listen to it once the podcast is done, because I truly do believe you learn more through repetition. But before going into that aspect, we not only learn from people's successes, but we learn from people's failures and people's difficulties. And if not more, you learn more from that. So I want to know right now, Richard, within your business, within your life, what is something that is a bit more difficult that you're having a hard time with, or you're having a challenge with, what is it? And how do you go about potentially fixing that solution? Work-life balance. I'm working 80 hours, so I don't have to work 40. I'd like to retire sometime soon so I could uh, write children's books and improve in my violin. I was really trying to impress my wife, but instead I'm depressing her, so I got to start practicing (laughs) But um, I I believe that the biggest challenge is just not quitting and having me time because, you know, you get wrapped up in things and it's very important for me to work out in the morning and to wash my convertible on Sundays and to play pinball every now and again so I can treat myself. And I work hard for those things so I can enjoy those things. And after about 20 minutes of decompressed stimulation, my mind wanders. I'm not a meditator from the Eastern philosophy where I can just sit there and and do that for hours, but there are certain things that I can do to trigger my mind. And it allows me to put things in perspective and to expand. And so I'm not saying I don't wanna spend time with friends and family, but Richard needs his own time Mm -hmm. in order for me to find my balance and focus and center. And as long as I can treat myself to that besides my own health and my own well being, I become very centered. And it it just allows me to be able to expand and to assist others. Richard, I love that because you mentioned, you know, meditation in the Western uh, world in that regards, but the ideology, sorry, the Eastern world in that regards, but what you're doing when you're washing your car is a form of mindfulness, because like you said, your brain is kind of taking a break. And to be quite honest, the subconscious mind works best when the conscious mind is not working. So you might be doing something at work and you're having a problem and trying to find that solution. And sometimes when you're just on it, working on it, working on it, working on it, it's not going to come. You need to take a step back. That's why a lot of people when they're in their showers, they're like, oh my God, that idea comes. Yeah, it's because you allow yourself to take a step back. So it's great as entrepreneurs to work hard, to put in the work, but you need that counterbalance. If not, if you're just working, you're going to hit that wall. So I love that you brought that up in the, in the forefront. You know, Richard. Albert Einstein got that theory of relativity on the home, on the train. I, when he yes. was away from his office. His, so, I mean, so, and, and, and Isaac Newton with the gravity, he was sitting outside just chilling by himself. So you always hear about that. They're always by themselves and everyone's leaving them alone because, you know, and that's when they have their eureka moment. And I love that you mentioned Albert Einstein and the fact that you play violin. In fact, like he was a violinist. Not a lot of people necessarily know that. And when he used to do mathematical problems with his colleagues and he had a hard time finding it, he used to just get up in the middle of the day and leave to go play violin. And everybody's like, what are you doing? He's like, I can't find the answer right now. Let me go play violin. And then once he used to play violin, then he used to allow once again his subconscious mind to leave room to find the solutions. And then he would come back with a fresh perspective. So Richard, correct. I mean, this was an amazing, amazing conversation. Uh, We could, I feel like, rant until tomorrow morning. But before letting you go, 
I just want to kind of leave you the red carpet here. Where's the best place that our listeners could connect with you if they want to know more about your services, anything in that regards, where's the best place they could get in touch with you? And thank you so much for allowing me to share this. First is buy a first class plane ticket and come visit me. That's number one. But uh, until that time, you can, you can more than feel free to give me a call, 888-271-6750. Shoot me an email, CEO at Costa Rica's callcenter.com. And, and finally, we have a very large Facebook fan page. I got about 97,000 local Costa Rican Ticos, and oh. it can give you a real pulse on near shore Central America, Costa Rican BPO, business process outsourcing. And, and you also get to see some of the fun stuff that goes on at night too. So uh, please join and I look forward to anybody, including your visit one day. And I, I can't thank you enough. I had the most wonderful time with you and your audience. Are you sure we're not related? <laughs> it seems like we, we're really on the same page. A brother from another thank mother. So I always say that. <laughs> I love I love that, Richard. I mean, first of all, I'm definitely going to take you up on that. And if ever you're in Montreal on that, and you you definitely let me know as well. But yeah, thank you very much for everything you're doing. Everything you mentioned will be in the show notes uh, below. So the, the Facebook group, uh, his contact info in regards to the numbers that he gave, as well as his LinkedIn and all that fun stuff. Richard, once again, thank you very much for all the greatness that you're doing. Awesome uh, podcast, and we'll definitely speak. Christopher Dedian here. Thank you so much for listening to the Peak Performance Fitness Show. If you're a successful entrepreneur or intrapreneur who would like to be on this program, please visit our website at peakperformancegreatness.com. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? Just do a quick screenshot of your phone, text it to a friend, or post it on the socials. If you know somebody that could be a great guest, please tag them on social media to let them know about this program. And don't forget to include the hashtag Peak Performance Greatness. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We regularly put out new episodes and content. To make sure that you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and click that subscribe button. Your thumbs up, rating, and review go a long way to help us promote this show, and it would mean a lot to me as well as my team. You want to know more? Go ahead and visit our website at peakperformancegreatness.com or follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, or my YouTube channel at Christopher Didia. Thank you for listening. We will see you next time. Have a blessed and grateful day. Thank you.